Okay, guys, welcome back. Thank you for turning up <laughs> in the afternoon on a hot day like this. Um, I hope you've been able to find a friend, find somebody that you can get along with and chat with and turn up with on the first day to lectures next week and feel like you've got someone you belong to and has got your back. That would be really nice. And you might meet some new people when you get into your mentor groups this afternoon as well. So that's basically what our afternoon is. I'm going to just go through, work you through what the bachelor program looks like. So as I said, you can start to put together some of those jigsaw pieces that we spoke about, the people that you met um, this morning and where they fit in. Um, and then the rest of the program is going to be meeting your mentors and having a bit of a tour um, with your mentors. So this looks all a bit complicated um, and a bit hard to read perhaps from up the back there, but this is basically your program for the next four years. Starting in first year, we've got um, two lines basically. This one is first semester and this one here is second semester. And then you go into year two, first semester, second semester and so on. You'll see that there are some dotted lines down here. Our course is designed to be studied full time and in that order. Um, and it's really set up like that so that you've got all the foundational knowledge and skills that you need, for example, in your first year topics that you then take in to your second year topics and start applying. And similarly, from your second year topics that you take into your third year topics and then into your big um, fourth year senior year. So in your first year, um, you can see some of those topics that we've talked about already. Uh, and these are the ones that you should be enrolled in. So as you sort of are going, as I'm saying the codes for the topics, make sure they're the ones you're enrolled in in first year. So 1201, Psychological Aspects of Speech Pathology, that's the psych topic. And that's the topic that Lauren is topic coordinator for. Um, there will be a human bioscience topic that's actually a health sciences topic. So it's health 1004. And you met um, Rowena, who's the topic coordinator for that topic in health sciences. That's the one where you'll probably be down on Sturt campus. And similarly with Lauren, for psychology, you'll be down on Sturt campus. Um, in the health bioscience topic, you'll actually be with other students of other disciplines. So they might be studying health sciences to get into physio or to OT, or they might be just doing a degree in health science. They might want to be going into optometry. So there's all sorts of different potential allied health students you'll be studying with, which is kind of a nice opportunity to learn about those other courses as well and eventually how speech pathologists work with those other professions. Um, but you will have that foundational knowledge in human body systems, uh, anatomy and physiology. The next topic you have is the linguistics and phonetics. And as Susie said, who's your topic coordinator, you actually get the luxury of doing in the bachelor program two topics in linguistics and phonetics. The masters don't get that. They get a really short fire course um, one third of one topic is linguistics. You get two full topics, so make the most of that. You will probably need it if you don't have much of a background in linguistics and phonetics, which is the science of language and the science of sounds, because talk to your mentors about it when you get in your group. It is critical to have that foundational knowledge. When you go into then applying your knowledge of language and speech into uh, child development of speech and language and child disorders of speech and language. It's also critical when you come to me in third year. So guys, you'll be revisiting your linguistics and phonetics again because that's when we unpack adult language and acquired language disorders that can come from a stroke, for example. You need to know how to analyse language, how to listen to sound systems, um, how to um, transcribe them, 
into an in what we call the international phonetic alphabet um, and be able to put together an intervention plan that is systematically and hierarchically devised to address those language and speech difficulties that either the child or the adult has. So this um, linguistics and phonetics is foundational. And then because those uh, other three are quite theoretical topics, um, really, really needed for your foundations for speech pathology, we actually want you to be introduced to what clinical practice is in speech pathology. So that's what our first year, first semester topic is, um, 1104. So that's a clinical skills practice. It also includes some study skills, learning how to use a library to find references, learning, learning how to reference your assignments accurately, um, learning how to, what evidence-based practice means. Um, you will do a, a little, um, I think you do one or two group assignments. You do one group assignment in linguistics as well, so that you're starting, as Lauren said, to start to work um, out how you work in a team. Um, so they're really, really important skills to learn. I know some people like to just study on their own, but this is, as Jane said, a relational course and you need to learn to work with others as well. We get you straight into that in first year. You'll be put in study teams in first year. All right. In the second part of the year, so second semester, we introduce you to research methods. Um, and that was Emma, you met, who will take that topic. You'll do more in child development and learning. And again, that'll build on the psychology aspects um, and Lauren will take that topic. Um, you'll build again on anatomy and physiology and that's Beck's topic and you will look specifically at the head and neck area and what we need for speech and how our brain works. Um, and then we do a, a more advanced course in linguistics and phonetics. So that's your foundational year in first year. Okay. Any questions about that and enrolment in topics? All right. Yes. Are we supposed to enroll child in the adults? You can. Okay, you've had trouble enrolling in them? Okay. Has other pe have other people had trouble enrolling in second semester? I'll have to look up what's going on there. Thank you for letting me know. Um, so, okay. So when you're trying to enrol and go into classes, because there are some clashes, so there shouldn't be clashes in second semester. Okay, good. I'm um, not sure whether people on the recording will hear that, but the idea is um, just check that your date range is semester two only because there are a number of options, aren't there, for classes in Health 1004. So that might mean that, um, and that's an available topic in second semester as well. It's not when speech pathology students should be studying it. Please study it in semester one or you won't be eligible to um, study the second anatomy and physiology of speech in semester two. Um, but if there's clashes like that, it might be something to do with the settings. And if you're still having trouble, talk to Ask Flinders, enrolment people, talk to your mentors when you get into your groups today. They might be able to help you as well. All right. Um, now, this is a dotted line. Um, but what you can see is there are formal prerequisites to go into some of our second year topics. But pretty much you need to pass all of these topics before you can go into second year. 
And in second year in semester one, you'll be learning about speech and language disorders of children from birth to five years. And associated with the professional studies topic, which is kind of your more theoretical topic where you learn the basis of disorders, you learn the theory, you apply that learning in case-based learning. So that's what sort of starts up in second year and we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. And that's supported by a clinical skills topic. So you'll see these blue arrows are what we call co-requisites. They're studied together because one supports the other. What you do in one supports your clinical skill development in the other and the clinical skill development supports your learning of the theory in the other topic. So we kind of call them paired co-requisite topics. So speech and language disorders of children, zero to five, and then your motor speech topics, which is um, the professional studies topic again with the clinical skills, and that's Beck, who you met today, okay? In second semester, similarly, you'll study um, speech and language disorders of children five to adolescent, uh, and it's co-requisite, it's partner topic clinical skills in that area. And then you'll move on uh, in second semester to swallowing and voice with Sebastian, who you met, and Jane, co-teachers in those topics. And that, again, is paired with the clinical skills topic. So you're starting to work with children and learn to work with adults right from the get-go in second year, okay? Disorders of speech, disorders of language, disorders of voice and swallowing and how you as speech pathologists will intervene. There's some really important assessments in those topics that are developmental assessments that show your trajectory towards competency in those range of practice areas that I was saying before are really important for your accreditation or for our accreditation of your course and that help you develop the competency to become an entry level speech pathologist. So there will be hurdle tasks in like which are must pass assessments in those second year topics right from the get go. All right, so again, there's a bit of a hard border there between second year and third year. We want you to finish your second year topics, be competent and pass before you come into third year and start studying the next lot of disorders. In third year, that's when you'll work with me and with Claire um, and potentially Kristen as well, um, in acquired language disorders of adults. So that's when we start talking about stroke, uh, dementia, traumatic brain injury, that kind of thing, where, that, um, where people can acquire speech and language disorders um, from something traumatic like that. So that's um, first semester um, in third year, and it's supported as well um, by a clinical skills topic. I'll get to that in a minute. The second area of practice you look at is complex paediatrics. So you're actually starting to put together now, um, you know, a really holistic view of a, of a child, their family, how disorders can co-occur, how you can work on communication and feeding perhaps in a child. So you're starting to get into some of those real specialty areas of practice of autism disability, paediatric feeding, and so on. That's what your mentors are gonna be doing this year, so hopefully they're excited about that. And then the clinical skills topic is there as one topic to support both of those adult acquired language, um, professional studies topic, and the complex paediatrics topic. So I teach into that, so does Emma, and then Jane teaches counseling in that topic as well. So you'll um, learn really important therapeutic counselling skills in third year. We go on then to the second acquired language disorders topic of adults, and that's where we look more at cognitive communication disorders. Uh, for example, people who've had, again, traumatic brain injury, frontal lobe damage, perhaps dementia. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen on the news about Bruce Willis having the diagnosis of frontotemporal dementia. We have a case, uh, Bruce Willis is an actor, for those of you who don't know, um, 
who's had to retire because he's got this progressive aphasia, difficulty with his speech and language, and um, has now, it's come out that he's been diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia, which is a type of dementia that really impacts language first. Um, and we have a case about that in third year. So um, you'll be learning about how those disorders, progressive neurological disorders can start to impact communication and swallowing as well. In second semester, you have your complex adult topic. Again, a bit like the complex peds, starting to put together now a holistic pe pe picture of people who have swallowing, speech, language, cognitive disorders, all in the one disease process like motor neurone disease or um, laryngectomy or like real kind of niche specialist areas of our practice, okay? So if, you, if this piques your interest, um, uh, great, you know, you've come to the right place. If you didn't know that speech pathologists work in these areas, you will soon. And hopefully, you know, even though you kind of come in thinking, I just want to work with kids, you'll see the expanse and the range of areas that we can work in and, you know, potentially, um, yeah, change your thinking about your profession that you've entered. All right. So third year is just as busy as <laughs> second year, but in addition to your theoretical topics, or your academic topics, I should say, you start to go on placement, which is fantastic. So in third year, you have one day of placement um, out in the community. Uh, it might be in a school. It might be in a private practice. It might be... Um, where else do people go? In the... Stuttering clinic, the fluency clinic here. It might be at Health to Go, which is down at Sturt. Early intervention, education department in schools. Yeah. So these guys, again, would have had their placement allocated. Some of them might be already on placement. Ask them about the placement program. That's when you have to start uh, putting together, integrating your clinical and your academic program. So it's an extra challenge. So... If you think first year is hard, it kind of developmentally gets harder, but that's okay, you're ready for it. <laughs> the mentors might have something to say about that. Okay, so you have a prac in first semester one day a week and second semester one day a week, or maybe even two days a week for a shorter amount of time. So often you do have that placement. Yeah. Yeah. So in. I'm just reminded that in your speech and language topics in second year, you also get to go out to schools uh, and do a learning assisted program, which is kind of a placement, but it's not a formal placement. You're not assessed on it, but you get an opportunity to go out to schools with normally developing kids. There might be kids with difficulties with learning language as well, um, but you're not there to be uh, to intervene. You're just there to really to help with the existing LAP program that they have. Has anyone heard of a LAP program? Um, learning assisted program, it's basically going out, you're, again your mentors can talk to you about it, but helping kids with their learning a little bit more one-on-one, -on -one, uh, listening to them read, helping them to, to read books um, at whatever language level they're at, and you arrange um, your own school that you go to and visit. So that does happen in second year, you're right. The formal placement program starts in third year. And then have a look at this. In fourth year, we hardly see you. Um, you have a research topic that's all online, and then you have two big PRAC topics that are worth 13.5 uh, units. Each of these other little boxes is 4.5 unit topics. So this one, you start to go out on big, long placements. You go out into industry, you go to a hospital, you go to an aged care, you go to a private practice, you go to a community centre, you go to a school, and you're there for like 10 to 12 weeks, four days a week type thing. Um, maybe not, not that long, but um, you really get your teeth stuck into practice. You have one senior, um, one roster three, and then you'll go into your senior roster. Each of those rosters will be either paediatric, child-focused, or adult-focused. And you must have one of both, basically. So you might do your adult in roster three and your paediatric in roster four, or vice versa. 
but you definitely get experience with both so that as you graduate, you're competent to work in all of these range of practice areas across the lifespan. All right. Your final topic is like a capstone topic where we help you with transition to practice. We start to unpack what is it like to be a speech pathologist? What identity are you going to have in your profession? What's ethical practice? And we talk about that all the way through, but we kind of just cement it, I suppose, together in that final transition to practice topic. Um, there's a mentoring assignment that you do, and so you'll actually have um, second years that you'll have come out and visit you on placement in fourth year, so they can start to see what it's like um, to be in practice. So you'll get that opportunity in second year to go with a fourth year student out to their placement and look at a session plan and observe their practice. We're lucky this year because we've actually re-instigated the international placement program, which we had running for a number of years until COVID. So a number of our students have been able to go to India, to Thailand, uh, to I think they're the two countries we've been in. Um, this year, the third years are going to be offered to go for their roster two uh, to a couple of schools in Thailand, which is very exciting. And fourth years will be op offered an opportunity to go as their mentors. Okay, so just keep your eyes out for those kind of opportunities. Um, about 14, I think 12 to 14 students might be able to go, which is fantastic. In third year, you'll also have a call out to see if you're interested in joining the Honours Program, um, which is um, the next, it takes you to the next level. So um, the tertiary education quality framework has a number of levels. Each of your degrees, a, a bachelor degree is worth seven, an honours degree is worth eight, a master's degree is worth nine, and a PhD is, is 10. So um, you'll have an opportunity to do honours, which will kind of be a bit of an overload, but will s put you above, I suppose, um, the TEXA level um, than the regular bachelor degree. And this is a, a fully, um, a full research honours degree, which means um, you are eligible to go on and do research and, and study a PhD if you wish, if that's the pathway you wish to take. So there's research pathways, there's international placement path, you know, we have quite a lot of opportunity once you get a bit further through the program. So any questions about any of that? Yes? Yeah, so you both, in both programs, the Honours Program and the Bachelor of Speech Pathology Program, you qualify to work as a speech pathologist and be, as I said, eligible for membership of Speech Pathology Australia and work. No question there. The Honours Program has uh, a nine unit overload, so you actually do a little bit of extra study. Um, you'll do different assessments in third year that are more research-based, research ethics-based than clinically based. And then in fourth year, you'll do your block placement, first block placement over summer, your final block placement at the end of that year and that interim period, say from March to October, you'll be doing a research project with one of the staff um, in an area of practice that you enjoy, um, that we have a research program built up in You'll go out, collect data, you'll analyse data, you'll write it up into a manuscript. You might get a publication with your name on it. We um, develop a dissemination piece. You'll get practice in presenting um, potential pr presentations at conferences, etc. And you, you end up with a higher qualification, tertiary qualification level. So you end up with an eight as opposed to a seven. So there's no difference in what you learn in terms of the content and the topics you do. There's just some extra overload, which is your research project. Um, and then we squash the rest in. <laughs> you still finish at the same time. So you do an overload in fourth year of nine units. So um, to get into that, you want to be aiming for a GPA of five, which is a credit average. 
Okay. So have any of the mentors taken up that opportunity to do honours? No. Yep. But we do have, um, in your cohort, we have, um, I think there are six of you who are doing honours. The previous year we had 12. The previous year, I don't know, 10. You know, so it, it's not the whole, not everyone wants to do honours. I know at the other universities, everyone's doing honours. Um, you need to say Adelaide Uni, but they're not research honours, they're um, industry honours. I don't know what the TEXA level is that they come out with, but if it's not a research honours, you can't go then into more higher degrees in research. Does that make sense? It's um, usually a bit more group-based, industry-based kind of um, project, I suppose, work. Any other questions about the course and how it's structured? So we were talking today about, you know, those must-pass hurdle assessments. And most of our topics will have those hurdle assessments that must be passed. Um, as I said, don't worry, you know, it's not like school, well, be prepared that you've come in and it's not necessarily like school where you get the highest grade in the class all the time. There are going to be things that are your strength. There are going to be things that you struggle to learn. You will learn them and we will help you learn and we'll support you to learn them. But if by some chance you don't get, you know, straight through on the first go, there are opportunities to resit a number of our assessments. Like in anatomy and physiology, you know, if you're not good with exams, that's not your strength, you might find that you need to resit that. Or the linguistics test, if that's not your strength, but you must pass it, you might need to have another go at it. I don't know whether any of you guys have experienced that, a few nods. You thought you were coming in as a really good, strong student, and yet, when you hit some of this stuff, it's hard, it's a lot to learn, and there's a lot you're learning alongside of it. So. Um, we do give students, our assessment policy is very fair and equitable and does give students an opportunity to resit assessments. Now that requires you to at least attempt them and participate. So if anything else, come and talk to us if things are getting overwhelming um, and, and at least have an attempt at your assessments so that we can show you're participating, you're engaged that's when you get the other, the next opportunity. If you don't engage, and I'm probably talking to the converted here, you're the ones that are here, thank you. <laughs> there might be others in your cohort that aren't as invested. If you get to know them and meet them and tell, just tell them what I was passing on, you have to engage, you have to participate, um, and at least attempt things to get that opportunity to resit. Um, what we do have, as I said, is a, a full-time course where topics are only offered once in a year. So if you do end up failing a topic, you might not be able to go on to your second year until you do that topic again, which will only come around once in a year. So if it's a second semester topic, it's going to come around in second semester again. So you might actually need to find something else to do and end up doing your degree uh, over a longer period of time. So your four years blows out to five years, etc. That's happened and that's okay, okay? Don't think that you've failed. Um, sometimes people just have to do things twice to really consolidate their learning and we allow that um, in terms of study plans. That'll be when you'll come to me and we'll work out a study plan that allows you to continue your study but ensure that you've got all the prerequisites and co-requisites enrolled in at the right time. So don't just assume you know how it works. If you do end up failing a topic, most of your topic coordinators will put you onto me, we'll have a chat, we'll work out a study plan, I'll let you know what to enrol in in what order so that you can actually go through in the correct order and learn um, and pass the topics that are prerequisites for the next ones. Does that make sense? Um, 
I don't want to scare you at all, um, but that happens in first year. First year's a kind of a transition year. You know, you've got to kind of get used to what school was like, what uni's like, or if you've studied before, what speech pathology's like. It's pretty um, full on. And, um, you know, if you, if you trip and stumble, there's other opportunities. It'll be okay. Don't get, you know, too down on yourself. Um, we will support you through the next stage. Just come and talk to us. All right, so that's the program. Um, why isn't that advancing? Um, I think you've, you've met Lauren in Psychological Aspects of Speech Pathology. You've met Susie. You've met Rueda um, in Anatomy. So the only person you haven't met because she hasn't quite started yet, she's a new employee coming over to us um, from the rehab, age, palliative care, clinical um, service to us at Flinders Uni to become an academic, clinical um, specialist academic. Uh, Kat, Katerina, Kat Fusco, she's going to be your topic coordinator for the clinical skills and practice topic. Um, because she's still coming over, and needs a bit of orientation herself. I think Lauren is going to do the first couple of lectures with you or workshops with you in that topic. Um, so you'll definitely get all the information and foundational stuff that you need. So they're the four topics in your first semester you should be enrolled in at least. Okay, everyone good with that enrolment? Hands up, all good? Or thumbs up, whatever? Excellent. Come and see me if you've got any problems or talk to your mentors. Um, now I'm going to move on to the mentoring program. So before I do that, does everyone know what they're doing on Monday? Week one, next week, have you got classes? Some of you have? You have every day, all day. I know, the third years do, because I'll be there <laughs> with you. But the first years, some of you might have anatomy, physiology, or the human bioscience. No? What have you got? Who's got Monday classes? Oh, so I thought someone put their hand up. Yeah, what have you got? I think we've got three or four days a week. Yeah, I'm combining. So I've got my first week back at the Okay, so when you view your timetable, this is something you can do with your mentors. Get them to show you how to view your timetable. Because you can see it as a whole semester, or you can see it week by week. And you might want to work out how to see it week by week. Because when it's as the whole, it's like week 11 to 18 is this, and week 14 is that, and it's like, ah, oh, what's week? Yeah, this is week one. No, actually, the <laughs> just to confuse us, the syllabus weeks are different to the, you know, the university weeks are, instead of week one, they're a week 11. So it can be a bit confusing. Best to get your mentors to show you how to do a week by week, look at your timetable, and then they'll go through where the rooms are, where you need to go, etc. Um, right, so the mentoring program is something we've had in place for a number of years now. Difficult during COVID times, but I'm really, really pleased that we can get back together and actually do some face-to-face -face work so that the mentors can really actually physically, you know, guide you and help support you You'll get to know the other people in your mentor group, not just your mentor, but your other your peers. And so you start to form some connections that people you might want to work with on assignments or um, in groups and so on. So we found it to be a really great experience. It also helps the third years because one of the things that um, Speech Pathology Australia wants us to be able to do in our accreditation is lifelong learning, supervisory practice, um, mentorship is a really important thing for qualified speech pathologists to do. Um, and that's built into our new professional standards as well. So this is a fantastic opportunity for them to learn leadership skills, team building skills, um, yeah, how to supervise, for example, allied health assistants or staff when they go out in the workplace. These are all really good skills that you're developing. Um, contributes to your CV when you actually want to go out and get some work, you've got maybe a bit of a competitive edge. 
to someone who hasn't done this program or hasn't represented um, the student body or whatever, contributes to the Horizon Award, which is a university-wide program. Um, so what you're going to do is meet with your mentors. We've got the groups sorted. Um, once, it, once in um, the first four weeks, one to four, and then fortnightly for the rest of the semester during semester one. So only during semester one. And um, you are actually contributing to one of your assessments, therefore, by participating in your clinical skills topic, the 1104 topic. So there's an assessment to do with your role and your reflection on the mentoring experience in that clinical skills topic. Okay. So, what we might do now, and this is pretty much the end of the day, so if you've got any other questions, make sure you talk to me now. Um, yes, please, do. Yes, so lectures will be recorded. If it's timetabled as a lecture, you will see um, this red light going on in the lecture theatre and it will be recorded and it will be in your flow site as a lecture recording, which is like a yellow and white little icon. Um, tutorial groups, which are smaller groups, will not be recorded because the learning is done collaboratively and constructively with your peers and then you'll have a tutor who comes and supports that learning, but they won't be recorded. Um, clinical skills workshops, um, there'll be a mixture. Some people will record part of a workshop because it might be teaching you something or demonstrating something, and then people will break out into groups and give it a go and do some scoring of assessments or whatever, and so that bit won't be recorded because it will just be you know, humming in the background. Um, other people won't record any of it because it's all hands-on. So tutorials and workshops you should aim to attend, without a doubt. It's the hands-on doing stuff of learning. It's experiential learning, it's social learning, it's constructive learning, if you know anything about learning theories. Um, the lectures are more likely to be in the professional studies topics where you're being introduced to a theoretical approach or a you know, background about this, here are the options and the different approaches to this kind of intervention, and they will be recorded. Absolutely, it's worth being there because that's your opportunity to ask and clarify if you don't understand anything. Um, but if you can't be there, they're the ones to miss in a way because you can catch up through the recording. It's all integrated though, you'll find, and, and again, your mentors will probably be able to tell you you have a lecture, you have a workshop, and you have a case, and all three are designed in that one week to help you learn about a particular content area. So it's designed to be in that order or done together, so don't get too be far behind on um, listening to your lecture recordings because you won't get the content that supports what you need to do in your case, for example. That probably becomes more evident in second year. So as of second year onwards, we have cases um, of real people. They're actually real people um, that our industry partners have um, been able to get consent to use their information. And we've written kind of like a, a, a go to woe kind of case where you find out a bit about the child or the adult and how they're presenting what the parents are reporting, what information comes from their doctor or their school, you put all the information together and then you hypothesise, well, what assessments would I need to do? I've learnt about those assessments in the lecture and the workshop, I've learnt how to score them. This is what we're gonna do, these are the results. Okay, what's my diagnosis? And now, what's important to the child and their family? Let's set some goals around that. Okay, what approach to intervention am I gonna take? Where's the theory from the lecture about that? Where's the you know, workshop that we did that showed us how to put that into practice. And then we're going to devise an intervention plan and so on. And that's case-based learning. That's what we call case-based learning. That's when you're in your small groups together. 
it's really great for constructing your learning and applying all the things that you've already learnt theoretically to practice. It's great for your learning about professional conduct and how you work in a team. Uh, it's great for conflict management. You know, as I said, you know what you know, but you don't know what other people know, and they might actually help you learn. Um, so you're actually constructing. It's called, you know, social learning as well, um, and that's a really big part of our curriculum in second year and third year. Um, so lectures recorded, yes. Tutorials, no, but lots of important learning. Workshops, sometimes, maybe, parts, um, but mostly hands-on practice, best to attend. Hope that helps. Okay. Can we get um, Leah? You can all stand up. We've got Leah. I, I need to know who you are, though. Are you Leah? Yeah, I'm Leah. Great. Abby? You can all stand up, but please do come, come up. Abby, uh, Phoebe, great, Phoebe. I just got to try and remember some third year names. Uh, Victoria, are you Victoria or Tori? Uh, Tori. Tori, yep. Uh, Chloe, beautiful. Uh, Eleni? Eleni. Eleni. Eleni, sorry. Am I saying that right? Eleni? Eleni. Eleni. Eleni? Yes, that's right. <laughs> oh, I thought that's what I did to start with. Eleni? Perfect. Uh, so that's sort of stress on the right syllable, isn't it? <laughs> You'll learn all about that. Uh, indigo. Beautiful. And Jesse and Sarah. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to read out some names because you don't know who you're with, do you? Have you had that put up on any flow sites? No. Okay. All right. So actually, Leah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to have a go at reading your names? Do you, have the, you can do it. You don't have to do a good job. I don't know whether I am. And that's obviously okay, not everyone's going to be here. No, that's okay. You can read. All right. <laughs> Ariel Abati. Have I said that correctly? Uh, Abate. Abate. Thespina. Andinopoulos. Thespina. No. Uh, Ines. I know Ines was here. I talked to her earlier. Ines Ang. Oh, she was the one that went to, I think she's living in the hall, and there was something on at the hall she wanted to get to. So is isn't going to be here today. <laughs> um, Ruth Aquino. Ruth. No. Um, Michaela Baldwin. Mm -hmm. Ava Thatterson. Ava. Lovely. Ava, and then, are you Michaela? Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Hannah, Hannah Black, great, and Alexandra Brennan. Excellent. <laughs> so do you guys want to go find somewhere to chat? Um, guys, when you finish, do feel free to leave, um, and we look forward to, yeah, seeing you around campus. Have a great first week. Hope it all goes well. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Check, check with your mentor if they can help you, but otherwise, yeah, definitely. Email me and we'll make a time. If anyone's got any particular questions for me, do email me and we'll make a time to sort things through if you haven't been able to do it with your mentor. I'm not necessarily the best enrolment person. Ask Flinders is definitely your go-to for that. Um, but yeah, happy for you to email me. Okay, so Abby. Great. Abby, do you want to read your list? Oh, good on you. Here you go. Okay, I've got Bethany Fleet. I've got Olivia Fox. Great. Zephyr Freeney. Uh, Ruby Williams. Right. Praise Zandy. Alexia Heading. Uh, Madeline Hesketh and Elise Higginson. Oh, very nice. Great. Thank you. Are you praised? Yeah. Beautiful. Definitely. Excellent. Okay, have fun, guys. Phoebe? Yes. Do you want to read yours? Yeah. 
Emily Hutchinson, Peggy Jackson, Maya. Sarah Johnston, Kate Lovell, Abigail Cooper, and Amal Hassan. Yep. Great. Oh, I think three, four, three. Beautiful. Okay, enjoy, guys. Victoria. Okay, you want to do it? All right. Okay. Okay, I have Lauren Parsons. Annika Patterson, Chloe Patterson, um, Addison King, Zamira Cutlin, um, Sophia Litwin, Sophie Lorraine, and Sophie Maynell. Who's Sophie? Gorgeous. Okay. Beautiful. I think we had two Laurens in the Masters. We got two Sophies. That's cool. Yeah, cool. If anyone wants to stay in here, you're very welcome to as well. Um, Chloe? Uh, Sen Ho Hung, Harry White, Adam Saar, Hugo Shute, Lauren Southwood, Brett Stockel, Levi Wilson, Theodora Wong. So you're Hugo. Yep. Yeah. You must be Adam. Hello, Harry. Harry. Well, you've got all the boys in your group. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Sen, Cole? Yep, lovely. And Lauren. Lauren. Oh, you're a Lauren. Love a Lauren. Beautiful. All right, so Eleni? Yep. Oh, there it is. I did it again. That's all right. <laughs> it's Eleni. Eleni. Yes, yeah. that's it. <laughs> all right, so I've got Emma. Uh, I'm not too sure how to pronounce that last name. Ambag Chia, sorry if I said that wrong. Um, Sarah O'Donnell, Chelsea, another love, Ruby Gang. Um, Ellie Walker, Alanis, mm, yep. Keely Round, Taylor Sander, and Daniela Sato. Great, there we go. Got a few each anyway. Uh, indigo. Right. Oh, I got my hand. Uh, Kayla Burnett, Jade Butt, Clarice Davy, Kate Davy, Kiralee Delania, Sophia Deletta, sorry. <laughs> so, Caitlin England and Ad Adrian Ferguson. I swear our cohort doesn't have that many interesting last names. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out the origin of them all. Brilliant. And Jessie? Yeah. I I have N Natalie Fitzpatrick, Jacqueline yep. Flavel, Flavel, um, Anne Marie. Shinoch? Uh, I don't know. Shinoch. <laughs> Is it Anne Marie? Anne, 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 Anne Mary. Mary. Yeah. Sorry. Anne Mary? Uh, Emily Smith, Caitlin Warmold, Ella Radbone, Brielle Monroe, and Hoi Ching. Great. And so, does it make sense that, Sarah, you have the remaining four people here who might be Chelsea Metherell, Caitlin Pace? Jade Bullock, Emma Hunt, Emma, yep, Georgia Hoffman, yep, Abby Bruce, and Lucy Mensell. Great, Lucy. Excellent. Thank you.